well-liked by her family and friends, seen as generally a good person. She was single, and she was freewheeling and full of life. But instead of finding a second chance at love, she made a dangerous enemy. She tried to provide the best for her family, but sadly, she let evil lurk in. You can spend that much time with somebody and be so off on what they really are. I have one police emergency. He's in a car, the window's broke, she's bleeding. Investigators would be pushed to extraordinary lengths to unravel the mystery and bring a killer to justice. He thought he was being followed, and he was, as it turned out. That surveillance video is very telling. One of them was right out when she was killed. Oh, my God. As far as just being tragic and bizarre and twisted, it ranks very near the top. July 5th, 2003. Shortly after 11 p.m., police in the Tampa suburb of Pinellas Park received a panicked 911 call. 911, what is your emergency? I heard a noise that woke me up. I came down. She's bleeding. I can't get her to respond. Okay, what I is get her to wake up. First responders arrive at the home of 37-year-old Sandra Razo to find her collapsed in the driver's seat of her BMW. There was glass everywhere in the garage. There's blood everywhere inside the car. It was a brutal, terrifying crime. At this point, we didn't know if she was still alive or had passed away. They hurried her very quickly onto an ambulance into the closest trauma center. Along the way, they determined she's been shot several times in the head, chest, and legs. They didn't know she had actually been shot until they started treating her and they realized how many injuries she had. She was shot eight times at close range. Sandy Razo was transported to the local hospital where she was pronounced dead. At that point, they shifted it to a homicide investigation. Back at the crime scene, detectives searched for clues to tell them what happened. At the scene, we still had uh, kind of a mess to deal with. I mean, we had a lot of broken glass and, and blood and just things that we weren't sure we're going to be evidence yet at that point. On the floor, they saw multiple shell casings, which are expended cartridges from a firearm, a 22 caliber rifle, which totaled eight. Once we realized we had an actual shooting, those things run through your mind. Is it a robbery? Was it an ambush? I mean, what, what are the circumstances? Her wallet's right there on the floor. Sandy Razo's money, credit cards, everything. The car's still there. You begin to rule out robbery almost right away. One thing seems clear. This was no random act of violence. If eight shots were fired, that sends a message of, this is personal. It was someone who didn't like Sandy, someone that had had a problem with Sandy, someone who wanted Sandy dead. In 2001, Sandy Razo was going through a breakup with an ex-boyfriend in Alabama. She needed to make a fresh start, so she moved to Tampa, Florida, and settled into the middle-class community of Pinellas Park. She was just such an outgoing, positive personality. Was very much into being a friend to people. She was a single mom, doing everything that she could to make life better for her child. She was sharing custody of her daughter with her ex out of state. She worked at a place called Green Iguana, which is a very popular hotspot, especially late at night. Sandy worked in an area of Tampa that was really the go-to place for nightlife. This was a place where you went to party. Sandy, she was a very outgoing, very athletic, friendly, helpful, a good employee. We all worked the same hours. It was basically just the weekends from 9 o'clock till 3 in the morning. Sandy was working hard and saving money, sharing a townhouse with her close friend, Tony Ponicall. But less than two years after moving to Tampa, she would be gunned down in cold blood. We dispatched two detectives down there to start interviewing him and finding out what he knew. Mr. Ponicall was the person who discovered the body. 
He was the person that called 911. Tony was at home asleep, and he heard a loud bang, and he went downstairs to investigate. Tony Ponticle told us he did hear the shots going off, and he thought they were just fireworks left over, you know, from the, the 4th of July. He realized the car was there, and he went out. He found Sandra bleeding and moaning in pain. He panicked. He was terrified. Tony Ponticall then immediately runs back into the house and dials 911 and reports, oh my God, my roommate has just been shot. I think she's dead. Please come, please come. As Tony tells his story, it becomes clear that Sandy was a lot more to him than just a roommate. He is destroyed. He is emotionally distraught. We found out in the investigation he wanted more out of the relationship, maybe it to blossom into boyfriend-girlfriend type relationship, maybe an engagement down the road or marriage. Tony claims that he respected Sandy's decision and things had remained platonic between them. But investigators can't help but wonder, had he really taken her rejection so calmly? Mr. Ponicle, we definitely viewed him as, as a suspect, being that they were in a, a close relationship. Those are the people that we want to start with at first. Coming up, police explore a new suspect and discover another layer to this growing mystery. He beat her up and raped her and held her prisoner for two days. He absolutely rockets to the top of the list of potential suspects. Park detectives are investigating the murder of 37-year-old bartender Sandy Razzo. Sandy's roommate, Tony Ponicall, the guy who calls 911, the guy who admittedly had a romantic interest in her, but she didn't want it. At this point, you, you don't know if he's a suspect or not. Obviously, you, you want to include those folks who may be a suspect until you rule them out. Detectives secure the crime scene and begin collecting evidence. But to their surprise... Tony also offers to let them search his car and personal belongings. He was very cooperative with us, giving us consent to collect evidence from his vehicle, from his home, and giving us honest answers to all the questions we were asking. Tony has been cleared as a suspect, so police expand their search in hopes of finding a new lead. She worked at a bar, and that would open up avenues for us to get to know who would know her and who might want to harm her. The number of times the person is shot when they're murdered says a lot about the person who pulled the trigger. And in this case, we have eight rounds. That's rage. Tony tells detectives he knows of someone that fits that description perfectly. A man by the name of Tracy Humphrey. Tracy worked as a bouncer at the bar where Sandy worked, and that's where they met. He was a model employee and the kind of guy you want to be friends with. Tracy also worked as a personal trainer in a nearby gym. And he liked to entertain Sandy with tales about his past. Tracy begins to explain to Sandy that, yeah, I was, used to be on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I used to be a star in Iowa on the football team there at the university. I was a model. Tracy had sort of pestered Sandy to go out with him, and she resisted that. When Sandy said no, that was it. Game on for him. Tracy starts to become a little bit clingy and... She immediately begins to back off. But Tony tells police that one night in February of 2002, Tracy crossed the line. He asked Sandy for a ride home and then somehow talked her into going inside his apartment. She alleged that he attacked her, sexually assaulted her. He beat her up and raped her and held her prisoner for two days. When Tracy finally let her go, she sought refuge with a friend who encouraged her to contact the police. She tells him what happened. And immediately, Tracy is brought in and arrested and charged with this kidnapping, sexual assault, rape. If you looked at the crime photos, she had a very strong case against him. There were bruises all over her face. But not everyone had been so quick to believe Sandy's story. He came across as being so kind, caring, Never heard him raise voice anything. He explained to me, like, hey, I had an incident last night. 
I'm kind of worried. We had a crazy, you know, wild sex thing that got out of control. And it, she seemed to like it. And it's kind of scary now because, you know, she's acting weird about the whole situation. Eventually, his case was set for trial. He was looking at perhaps 10 years or more in the state prison. But before the trial could take place, Sandy was murdered. He absolutely rockets to the top of the list of potential suspects. Detectives pay Tracy a visit at the fitness club where he works in the nearby town of Brandon. We tried to interview Tracy Humphrey. However, there were allegations by Sandy. So he respectfully declined to do an interview at the advice of his attorney. Despite Sandy's disturbing allegations, Tracy appears to have put the past behind him. In fact, he'd just gotten married the day before the murder to his 20-year-old protege, Ashley Lane. Ashley had met Tracy while she was working at a smoothie shop, and he worked at a gym nearby. She started practicing personal training sessions with him so that she could get her personal training certification. She seemed like the wholesome girl next door, and they really seemed like they were happy into each other. Just nine months after they met, the pair decided to tie the knot. They got married on July 4th. They didn't go on a big honeymoon. All they did was go to the beach. She wanted to get married on a day where every year they would have fireworks on their wedding anniversary. When police question her, Ashley says she and Tracy were both at home the night Sandy was killed. They did order pizza, and her friend Toby White had come over to visit. Toby was there at the house and saw them together. Ashley was a straight-A student, no criminal history, didn't get involved in anything bad. I don't think she had as much as a traffic ticket in her history. Detectives tracked down Toby White, a close friend of Tracy's. The police had contacted me, I believe it was probably two or three days after the murder, because Ashley had told them I was with them. She says, I was over Tracy's all night long on July 5th. Ashley was there. We got pizza. We watched a movie. At the time that the shooting occurred, he had a pizza delivered to his home and had a receipt for it. And the delivery man easily remembered delivering it to Tracy Humphrey. And their home is 45 minutes away from the scene of the murder. It appears neither of them could have been involved. Tracy had motivation, but his alibi checks out. Ashley Humphrey didn't even know Sandy Razo. But if Tracy didn't want Sandy dead, who did? Coming up, a witness changes their story, and a new piece of evidence turns the case upside down. Somebody's not telling the truth, because technical forensic evidence does not lie. So the question is, who had the phone in his or her hand, and who's lying? Just a few days into their investigation of the murder of 37-year-old Sandra Razo, detectives have hit a dead end. Her roommate, who called 911, and Tracy, who had a motive to kill her, you've eliminated them. So as investigators, you're scratching your head. Somebody wanted that woman dead. But when investigators talk to Sandy's friends and family, they soon come up with another lead. Her ex-boyfriend in Alabama, who has primary custody of their 13-year-old daughter. Whenever there's a custody battle with a child involved and one of those two people get murdered, you have to look at the other person. We did travel to Alabama to interview Sandra's ex and as well as talk to her daughter. There was a solid alibi. They were both in Alabama at the time that the murder occurred. So we were able to rule him out as a suspect or a person of interest. Detectives once again find themselves back at square one until they receive an unexpected phone call from a witness who wants to change her story. Toby one day calls us and says she would like to meet with us as soon as possible. Toby came back to us and said I wasn't with Tracy at all. That he had asked me to lie for him early on. Toby claims that after she found out about the murder, Tracy invited her to the house and asked her to provide him with an alibi. 
My feelings about Tracy being a suspect initially were there's no way he could possibly be involved in this. He's not that kind of person. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do if you don't go along with me being with you that night. I have to have an alibi and you're gonna have to be it. I kept telling myself, he must really feel that he'll be a suspect, so he has to have an alibi. That must be why he's doing this. Toby initially gives the alibi, trying to be a good friend. But in the days since then, Tracy seemed to become more paranoid and began threatening her. She starts getting concerned. Some of the physical threats while she was working out with Tracy, where he was saying if she talked to the police, something could happen. Toby changed her story. I was terrified. When you feel that your family could be harmed or you could be harmed, and unless they can arrest that person right that minute, you're vulnerable to them. But even though Toby has recanted her statement, the rest of the couple's alibi still checks out. Investigators obtained Tracy's cell phone records, hoping they might reveal some discrepancies. We learned that his cell phone was communicating near his residence there in Brandon. So it was obvious that his phone and him was at the residence in Brandon and nowhere near Pinellas Park at the time of the killing. Tracy's phone calls prove he was exactly where he said he was. However, the same can't be said of Ashley. They found that she was not at home, or at least her cell phone wasn't, on the night of Sandy Rose's murder. In fact, cellular tower activity showed Ashley's phone was used from a very suspicious location. There was phone calls being made between Tracy Humphrey and Ashley Humphrey, back and forth, from his location in Brandon to the location right outside where Sandy was working. But does that mean Ashley is the killer, or was someone else using her phone to cover their tracks? Somebody's not telling the truth because technical forensic evidence does not lie. So the question is, who had the phone in his or her hand and who's lying? Cold-blooded murder doesn't seem to match Ashley's profile as an honor student. But when investigators dig a bit deeper, they discover Ashley's past is much darker than anyone realizes. Her mother was an alcoholic. Her father was in prison. You see violence. You see a young girl being raised by her grandmother whom she counts on for everything and then that grandmother dies. You see a broken person. She was looking for something. She was looking for a father figure. And Tracy Humphrey provided that. Tracy provided security. Here's this older man. He is muscular, but also very kind of sensitive. She sort of fell under his spell. He begins telling Ashley, I'll take care of you. I'm going to sculpt you into the perfect woman. I'm going to help you work out, and you're going to be a model. So when Tracy proposed to her, Ashley wasn't just saying yes to the man she loved. She was saying yes to a second chance. The only roadblock in this Sandy. Sandy could send Tracy away to prison for 10 years. Tracy Humphrey had several arrests in his past. According to state law, if you're convicted with a battery, any subsequent battery will be a felony charge. Because of the actions he took against Sandy, he was looking at a possible you know, 10-year sentence in prison. Had Ashley decided to take matters into her own hands and get rid of the problem for her new husband once and for all? To catch a killer, detectives hatch a risky plan. But if it fails, they could have another murder victim on their hands. He could have snapped my neck in a matter of seconds. Tampa detectives have a new suspect in the brutal murder of Sandy Razzo, 20-year-old Ashley Humphrey, whose alibi was disproven when her cell phone registered activity close to the scene of the crime. The cell phone records quite neatly show Ashley leaving and going mobile right after Sandra clocks out of work, and in essence, following her over into Pinellas County. The very next call she makes which is right after the homicide, initiates off a cell tower in Pinellas Park, not far from where the homicide occurred. 
it opened up our eyes to the fact that she may have actually been directly involved with the murder. But also, you know, there's more work to be done. If Ashley did kill Sandy, was she acting alone or had someone else been pulling the strings? To find out, investigators come up with a dangerous plan. Toby agreed and consented to wear a recording device on her person, trying to elicit information from Ashley and Tracy regarding the homicide. It's especially risky because Tracy is already suspicious that Toby is working with police. He became very paranoid, wasn't sleeping, wasn't trusting people. With Tracy being that paranoid, of course he's going to be worried that Toby's going to drop a dime, as they say, on him at any time. He had also gotten in the habit of hugging me recently. I know he was checking for some sort of device. When Toby meets back up with Tracy at her house, it turns out he had been trying to reach her the whole time she was with detectives. Toby covers by claiming that she didn't answer the phone because she lost it at a local store. I had locked my phone with the police just to make sure he wouldn't find it on me. The police called and said, we found your phone at Walmart and you can come up and get it to try and get me out of the house. We went in his car. It was literally down to the second when one of the detectives got a vest on and got behind the counter and said, yes, we found your phone in the bathroom. I think he was really when my phone was there, but he still seemed very suspicious. Despite the scare, Toby agrees to wear the wire again. On October 22nd, 2003, Toby asks Tracy and Ashley to meet her at the gym. This time, police have also set up surveillance cameras. We came up with a fake subpoena to try and get him upset because I figured the best chance to get Tracy to say something by mistake was to get him mad. The document was simply a subpoena for her to appear before the state attorney's office and give a statement. Cell phone records indicated that she was in Pinellas County at the time of the killing. That was one thing that I hoped wasn't true. It, it showed like two or three times there was bouncing off Pinellas Park Towers. And one of them was right about when she was killed. Tracy was very, very concerned about the investigation. He was very frightened. He was very afraid. He started writing down on each side of a piece of paper, one for me and one for Ashley, what she was supposed to say and what I was supposed to say. Then he said, I want you to read all this and memorize it and then destroy it. That surveillance video is very telling. Their reactions to that and the statements they make during that night are not directly incriminating, but enough that the state attorney felt at that point they could bring it to a grand jury. But that's not all. Detectives also get a lead about a possible murder weapon from Ashley's mother's boyfriend. He says that he had given her a, a handgun that she asked for for her safety. He provided Ashley with a 22 caliber Ruger semi-automatic handgun that uses rimfire cartridges, which were the same caliber and style that we found at the crime scene. He tells police that Ashley never returned the gun. Tracy already seems to have a sufficient motive. He was facing jail time from Sandy's rape allegations. And while digging deeper into Tracy's recent activities, detectives also find charges on Tracy's credit card from a shooting range. Workers verify that he had been there with Ashley. He was at that gun range teaching Ashley how to shoot that weapon. Because Tracy had previous felony convictions, he violated not only state but federal law by being in possession of a firearm and ammunition. There was no smoking gun. There was no one piece of evidence that linked Tracy to this homicide. However, because he is a convicted felon and we've had witnesses that told us he did possess the firearm, he did load it, and he was helping Ashley fire it, that gave us enough probable cause to arrest him for being a felon in possession of a firearm. On December 18th, 2003, eight squad cars pull into the parking lot of the gym where Ashley and Tracy are working. We arrested her charged her with first-degree murder. 
Tracy was being charged with some federal weapon possession charges. Once I got the call that they had been arrested, I was ecstatic. I really felt like I was safe for the first time in a very long time. Tracy continues to deny any involvement, and Ashley appears ready to stand by her man. She refused to talk. She stated she wanted to have a lawyer. Do you understand what you're being arrested for? Um, this is the murder of a woman that I don't know. Okay. The indictment was handed down for you for the first degree homicide of Sandra Razzo. Okay. Get my turn. Uh, what do you mean, get him? I mean, bring him here. For what reason? Because I'm not speaking. I didn't do this. I'm not speaking without my attorney. She's in love with Tracy. You're not going to break her. She's like, yeah, my husband used to be on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, big star in Iowa, Iowa State University football player, a model. And investigators are, wait a minute. Your husband is none of those things. Your husband is a violent felon. Ashley finds out that everything Tracy ever told her is a lie. Ashley's world came crashing down. Coming up, Ashley decides to cooperate with police, and the story she tells is astonishing. Ashley had tried to kill Sandy once before. Ashley and Tracy Humphrey have been arrested for the murder of Sandy Razzo. Investigators believe Ashley's motivation had been to keep her husband out of jail. But now she's discovered that everything Tracy told her is a lie. He presented himself as a former professional football player, as an underwear model, when in reality, he had a huge, lengthy criminal past known to abuse several women. She realized that that whole relationship she had with Tracy was an affront. And she started realizing that she had been used. He thought that once he married Ashley, she would never testify against him because she wouldn't be able to legally. What the law says is we can't use verbal communications that you make with a husband or a wife during that marriage. However, actions can always be talked about. And of course, she could testify to everything that took place prior to that wedding. And after speaking with attorneys, that's exactly what Ashley has decided to do. Ashley's attorneys came to us and said she was willing to talk. We allowed her to plead to second degree murder and her sentence was 25 year minimum mandatory sentence. Tracy had convinced Ashley that he was innocent, that she was a scorned lover who was making up this incident and that he had nothing to do with a sexual assault. Sandy was going to prevent him and her from living happily ever after. She believed in him. She loved him. Ashley tells detectives that on the night of the murder, Tracy made her wait for Sandy outside the green iguana with a plan to ambush her. So on July 5th, she was watching Sandy's place of employment for numerous hours. Sandy left her work at the green iguana in Tampa. She got into her vehicle, and Ashley followed Sandy from Tampa over to her home in Pinellas Park. Ashley told us she parked right in front of their driveway. The garage door didn't even have time to go down. She walked up to the driver's side of the vehicle. Sandy was still in the driver's seat. She just turned the car off, and Ashley just started shooting into the car, and she shot a number of rounds from outside the vehicle into the vehicle, striking Sandy. Ashley says she fired without hesitation, and the reason why stuns everyone in the room. Ashley had tried to kill Sandy once before. It was a bombshell. And on the night of Memorial Day weekend, there was an attempt on Sandy's life. Ashley says that on the previous attempt, Tracy sent her to the green iguana with a rifle. She stayed in that car all day. When Sandra came out, she leveled that rifle across the parking lot at her, looked through a scope, pulled the trigger, the gun went off. Ashley shot through the passenger side mirror of her car. Sandra looked around like she heard a noise and then got in her car and left. 
Having shot their own car mirror, Tracy had gone to extreme lengths to get rid of the evidence. She goes back to Tracy after this attempt, and it was a failure, and he's upset, and they have to go into sort of a cover-up mode. So Ashley tells us they make their way over to another part of Tampa, purchase gas cans. Later on that night, the car is, is burned with gasoline down to the wheels. To prove she's telling the truth, Ashley takes police to the scene of the first shooting. Sure enough, guess what we found? Buried inside of a motel door there, a slug. That slug that matched the firearm that she was utilizing when she attempted the killing of Sandy at that time. She also shows investigators where they buried the gun she used to kill Sandy. We went out to this, this remote location with her and found the murder weapon. The handgun was put in a plastic bag and buried, and that was so at some point she could give it back to her mom's boyfriend. Ashley was relieved, but she was a defeated woman. She, she knew she was taken advantage of. She knew she was manipulated. She just came across, as a matter of fact, she came across believable. She was detailing everything for us and what he had to benefit from it, but certainly didn't shy away from the fact that she was complicit in the murder and what she did. Her confidence level in making a case on him was exponentially better after she talked to us. Police finally have the evidence they need to charge Tracy with first-degree murder. We actually went over to Hillsborough County where he was still being held in jail and informed him that he was being charged with these new charges. He will be transferred from Hillsborough County to Pinellas County to face trial. But prosecutors nearly lose their chance to convict him. On April 16, 2004, Tracy makes a daring escape from the transport van on his way to the courthouse. Tracy is a big guy. Right, 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 at the time, 225. And here's this maniac, this psychopath running around. Police immediately lock down the surrounding area, and the manhunt begins. He was gone for hours upon hours, out and about in the community. Out come the sheriffs and the marshals and everything. They finally track him to, like, a marsh. And he's coiled like a snake around a tree with some brush over him. With Tracy back in custody, his trial is set to begin. However, the outcome is still anything but certain. I thought he was the greatest guy in the world for over two years. So, of course, if you put him on the stand, you can convince other people of that. I was dreading the trial because I didn't know what the outcome would be. Coming up. Would this con artist be able to pull the wool over the jury's eyes as well? He had no idea that she was going to do this. He wasn't there. He didn't pull the trigger. Tracy Humphrey faces the death penalty in the murder of Sandy Razo. His wife, Ashley, has already confessed and taken a plea deal to testify against him. You would have a husband and wife essentially testifying against each other. And the fact that you had an older man with a history of deception who was able to get a young woman to marry him one day and kill for him the next, that's just so unusual. I think we felt pretty good about the case we had against him. In my mind, it really hinged on their ability to believe Ashley. On February 14th, 2006, almost two and a half years after Sandy's murder, Tracy's trial begins. The trial starts on Valentine's Day. I found it quite ironic. This was all about love, right? Prosecutors describe him as a violent criminal who used his wife to take vengeance against Sandy for accusing him of rape. Tracy Humphrey had convinced Ashley that he was being wrongly accused by a girlfriend that was jealous. Tracy was saying, I can't go to prison. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I love you. She's lying. He was very manipulative. She became enamored with him and for whatever reason seemed to be very subservient to what he wanted. To keep suspicion off himself, Tracy directed Ashley to take care of all of the details. He's got that type of street smart that he feels he can beat the system. He was thinking that nothing would come back to him. 
Ashley had received a firearm from her mother's boyfriend. Ashley tells the jury that after her first failed attempt, Tracy sent her back with a warning not to mess it up this time. And when Sandy Rozo left the bar, she followed over the bridge and into Pinellas County. So uh, Sandy Rozo pulled into her garage. The door was still up before she could even get out of the vehicle. Ashley shot numerous rounds into the vehicle. And ultimately into Sandy Razo, killing her. She says Tracy even coached her on what to do afterward. Tracy had told Ashley, make sure that you get the job done. You don't want her waking up on the hospital bed telling what happened. You want to look in her eyes and look for a certain vacant look that will confirm that indeed she's dead. After the shooting, she, along with Tracy, went out and buried the gun in the woods in Hillsborough. The next morning, they go to the gun range and they shoot and they get gunpowder on themselves so they could explain why, if they were caught, why there was gunpowder on their hands or clothes. I loved him very much, and I did not want to lose him. But you were willing to kill another human being because you loved him? Yes. He's the one that had the most to gain out of this, and where he participated in this case by helping destroy evidence and the statements that he, he makes along the way to her that are verifiable, it's very obvious that he was in charge. On February 23rd, he takes the stand in his own defense. He has a pretty solid defense on paper. He wasn't there that night. That's easily proven. He was at home. He basically blamed Ashley Humphrey. He said it was all her idea. He had no idea that she was going to do this. He wasn't there. He didn't pull the trigger. He couldn't explain away those videotapes that we had of him interacting with Toby White and Ashley. He couldn't explain the number of calls as Ashley sat there and waited for Sandy to get off work. And you told her over and over, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, correct? That is correct, I did say that. Here's a character that has a lengthy criminal history. He's lied. He's accused of rape and battery and kidnapping on his ex-girlfriend. So people just didn't buy it. On February 24th, 2006, both sides rest their cases. And less than three hours later, the jury returns with their verdict. They came back with a verdict of guilty as charged, which is murder of the first degree. I will sentence you to the Department of Corrections for the rest of your natural life. If you have no possibility of parole. I was at home when the verdict came back. It was just such a sense of relief. I had feared all along that he would get off on this charge because he can con people. Uh, he didn't get off. If we hadn't utilized Ashley as a witness, Tracy probably would have gotten away with murder. This guy who has apparently gotten away with so much in his life is getting what he deserves and, and exactly what he didn't want, which was jail. <laughs> But while justice has been served, nothing can repay the terrible cost of his revenge. Sandra's daughter missed out on having a mom for the rest of her life. Her, her mom, her sister, missed her tremendously. and the bad girl against each other. They would taunt each other on social media, push each other's buttons to the max. You're letting the world know you're kind of just adding fuel to the fire. Guaranteeing you, I'm no murder you. But their social media war would explode into the real world with devastating consequences. These girls, the escalation of the anger was just incredible. And investigators are left to unravel the truth behind a love triangle gone horribly wrong. You wouldn't think something like this would ever happen.
going on? What is an emergency? There's some people fighting out here, and there's a girl running in the middle of the street, but I don't know what the hell's going on. And we need police out here now. They're fighting. you got to hurry up and get here, quick. Sure, sure, they're already on the way. Officers are immediately dispatched to an address in a residential neighborhood in Pinellas Park, Florida. It's a nice neighborhood. It's a working middle class uh, neighborhood, so that was kind of out of place. For a town that has just a little over 55,000 residents in it, we don't have violent crime on a regular basis. When I pulled up at the scene, I saw kids, like high schoolers. Some guys yelling and some of the girls are screaming, crying, and they're running from this area where this van was. I wasn't sure what we had at that point, and I walked up to the area. I could see a green minivan that was stationary in the middle of the road, and there was a female that was laying on the ground, her feet were underneath the van, uh, and there was a crowd of people around her. I didn't really know what was going on. Um, I just saw there was a young girl that was hurt. As the officers get closer, they see the girl is in critical condition, bleeding from a chest wound. She was unresponsive. She was having a hard time breathing. She had a blank stare. She was not conscious. And that was a sad sight, just seeing her lay there. While EMTs rush the victim to the nearest hospital, the officers secure the area. First thing police learn is the name of their victim. 18-year-old high school senior, Sarah Ludeman. Sarah Ludeman was a local girl, grew up here in Pinellas Park, single child, two great parents. Her parents always wanted a baby. They couldn't have one. Then all of a sudden, along came Sarah. It was one of those miracles. So she was doted on quite a bit. She was an only child. She was showered with love from her parents. She was smart. She excelled in athletics. She was involved in her church. And she was so innocent. But in the fall of 2008, that all seemed to change when she met a popular 19-year-old named Josh Camacho. Sarah's, you know, an average girl. Uh, very much not his type. But what does he do? He zeroes in on Sarah, and he just went after her. The two immediately formed a connection, even though Josh was the complete opposite of Sarah in almost every way. He was the type of guy you absolutely do not want your daughter to date. Josh, I think, tried to at least portray that image and live up to that if he could. There were several photographs that he would post where he was, you know, posing with his shirt off, smoking, a uh, gun in his hand, things of that nature. Josh also had a reputation as a ladies' man. I think Josh Camacho fancied himself as, as what you'd think of as, as a player. He definitely had some experience in the world of dating with other women, where Sarah counter to that was a much different person, much more reserved. Despite their differences, Josh made Sarah feel special in a way no one had before. And the teenager was smitten. When you're a typical teenager, your hormones are going crazy. You're not thinking clearly. They began communicating more frequently, and then things kind of escalated from there. Soon the two were inseparable. I think Sarah saw this as, you know, her first true relationship. Once Sarah started dating Josh, she was having the time of her life. Here's a guy telling her everything she wants to hear. From that point on, Josh was all Sarah could think about. She's a teenager. Sarah felt like Josh walked on water. She fell for him. Sarah gave him her heart. Now, she was clinging to life. While Sarah is rushed to the hospital, investigators are still working the crime scene. When investigators start interviewing the friends, Sarah's friends are quick to say, Sarah started dating Josh Camacho. Coming up, 
Investigators uncover a relationship filled with secrets and lies. He had already had a child now with another woman. And learn how social media sparked a vengeful rivalry. The story starts taking on more and more layers. EMTs have rushed teenager Sarah Ludeman to the hospital after Pinellas Park police found her bleeding in the street. It was just pure chaos. Kids all over the place, running, yelling, crying, screaming. In the emergency room, doctors assess Sarah's wounds. Sarah was stabbed in the chest. She was stabbed twice. It was brutal. She did suffer a stab wound to the upper left shoulder and then one directly over her heart. So certainly a serious life-threatening injury. While surgeons work to treat Sarah's critical wounds, police at the scene are left trying to piece together what happened. Who would stab the 18-year-old high school student and why? We were looking for if there was any weapons used, what kind of stabbing? Was it a knife? Was it a blunt? What was it? You're looking everywhere for everything, but I could not see anything. While questioning witnesses, including Sarah's friends, detectives learned that she had been dating a boy named Josh Camacho. He was popular because of his weapons and his hard attitude. And I believe that's the only reason is because people were more afraid of him. The victim's parents arrived on scene, so we were trying to keep them calm. The family was very upset on the scene. I could feel for them as a father. When I put myself into the place of Sarah's parents, their only daughter, stabbed, it, it's devastating. I mean, it destroyed them. Once they're able to calm down, Sarah's parents tell police they've had concerns about their daughter's relationship with her boyfriend, Josh. Sarah's parents, they were obviously apprehensive about this. They were familiar with Josh, at least as they learned more about him, and still trying to protect her as a young, innocent girl. Sarah grew up in a very protective, safe environment. Her parents kept track of her. They, you know, obviously monitored the things that she was doing. Her parents say they tried to be supportive at first. Mr. Ludeman did, I think, what most good dads would do when their daughter's dating someone they don't necessarily approve of. He kept that kid as close to him as he possibly could. He would take him to raise games. He would invite them to hang out at the house. He wanted to make sure that he didn't chase his daughter away by chasing her boyfriend away. But they had no idea how much power Josh had over their daughter until they started noticing changes in her behavior. Joshua Kamasha was pretty much her first true love, and I think that affected her and kind of changed her in a way because he became part of her life. As Sarah begins to date Josh and fall in love with him, she begins becoming a different person. She begins not caring much about school as she used to. And he might feed her self-esteem, but he's changing her to become the way he is. Sarah's parents felt Josh was a bad influence, so they pressed their daughter for more information about her new boyfriend. What they discovered gave them even more cause for concern. During this time, he had already had a child now with another um, woman. Her parents learned that when Sarah met Josh, he had a girlfriend who was pregnant with his baby. Josh, a teenager, already has one child, and according to all the reports, he's not paying any money for that child. Girls seem to go for the bad ones sometimes, and he was bad news. After telling police what they know, Sarah's parents head to the hospital to be with their daughter. Meanwhile, her friends tell detectives that despite Josh's bad reputation as a player, Sarah was convinced she was the only woman in his life. I don't know that Josh saw her as anything more than just 
maybe the next person that he was going to date. Whereas Sarah, I think, saw it as more of a, you know, hey, I just want to be with you type of thing and not anybody else. Sarah was in love and she wanted everyone to know. So she did what many teenagers do. She wrote about her feelings online. You know, Sarah posted one picture of her and Josh together and she wrote a caption. So this tells me what? She had fallen for this guy, hook, line, and sinker. She was saying, look at me, I'm with him. And as we all know, social media puts it out there for the world to see. Sarah's friends say that's when she found out she wasn't the only woman in Josh's life. Sarah's posting all these images of her and Josh on MySpace of them in love. And then she gets a message out of nowhere that says, w -w wait a minute, I'm his girlfriend. Who the hell are you? Sarah had no idea that Josh was being unfaithful. And when she found out, it made her explode. Coming up, as doctors fight to save Sarah's life, detectives learn the identity of her rival. You keep playing a game. You're a pathetic little bitch. Honestly, what the do you have that's going for you that Josh wants you over me for? Ellis Park, Florida, high school senior Sarah Ludeman is being treated in the emergency room for multiple stab wounds to the chest. Six months before the stabbing, Sarah discovered her boyfriend Josh Camacho was seeing another girl. Her name was Rachel Wade. Once Sarah starts posting these pictures and these love captions on MySpace, Rachel sees that and says, w -w -w wait a minute. I'm his girlfriend. Like Sarah, 19-year-old Rachel Wade grew up in Pinellas Park. Rachel Wade was your typical teenager, came from a middle-class, hard-working family, and really seemed to have it all. Rachel was outgoing and very social, one of the cool kids in school. She probably maybe had some of that bad girl persona about her. I became a little rebellious, very independent, uh, strong-willed. Rachel took her teen rebellion farther than most girls, however. At 16, she moved out of her parents' house and dropped out of school. She started working at a local restaurant to support herself. She worked full-time as a server there, and she had her own apartment, and she was pretty much independent. She was kind of spreading her own wings and was doing her own thing, just becoming her own person at that point. She seemed to have her pick of the boys in Pinellas Park, including Josh Camacho. They had begun dating over the summer of 2008 and dated through the end of that winter. So it came as a shock when Rachel saw the picture of Josh kissing Sarah on social media. According to her friends, Sarah confronted Josh about cheating with Rachel, but he denied it. Sarah goes to Josh and says, what is Rachel Wade, this girl talking about you're with her? Josh says, wait, baby, that's old news. That's been long over. Don't worry about it. And Sarah believed him. And so you have now Josh in the middle of this where he's actually playing both sides of the coin. It seemed like he was going back and forth at times with different girls that he had dated, in this case, Rachel and Sarah. Sarah's friends tell police that she was scared of losing Josh, so she decided to trust him and put the whole thing behind her. That is, until Rachel started attacking her online. You can be so much more brave on social media with your threats. You may not say that to someone face to face, but you certainly could threaten them on social media. They would post things, photographs at the beach, things of that nature. Rachel began to attack those photographs almost in a cyber bullying capacity. So why would you wear that to the beach? You know, don't you know you look fat? Cool things, clearly designed to hurt Sarah. That's when the two girls started to compete for Josh's attention. 
But I certainly think that that generated some rivalry between the two of them where now not only did just the two of them know that they were kind of dating Josh back and forth, but now the whole world knew. They were leaving pictures anytime they were with Camacho. They were taking pictures of them with him, almost like to show each other, like, look, I'm with him now, and, you know, I have him type of thing. And Sarah's friends tell police that no one seemed to be enjoying it more than Josh. Josh Camacho definitely played these girls off of each other. He would go with one one day and take pictures with her, knowing she's going to post these. But at the end of the day, he's telling Sarah, oh, I love you and I want to be with you. He drew some sort of joy out of being the center of attention, if you will, having two girls vying for his affection. Surprisingly, neither Sarah nor Rachel seem to blame Josh. He is clearly the one that's not doing the right thing. But you have two girls that simply can't see that because love gets in the way. Rivalry just seemed to be more out of jealousy, and it rose from that. They just continued to bicker, if you will, back and forth. There was posting of pictures and things like that on the social media that was starting to basically build this fight. But Rachel took their online rivalry one step further. Hey, Sarah. It's Rachel. I'm on my way to the park. Sarah's friends tell police that Rachel got Sarah's cell number and started leaving threatening voicemail messages. So Sarah decided to fight back by showing up at the restaurant where Rachel worked. Sarah had gone with some of her girlfriends and sat in her section so that Rachel had to wait on her table to intentionally give her a hard time. Sarah and her friends sent the food back, made complaints about the service, and made it rough for Rachel. Sarah didn't show up with Josh at Rachel's place of business, but enough to where Sarah would show up and maybe rub it into Rachel's face, you know, about, you know, hey, I'm the one dating him. Not to be outdone, Rachel would then reciprocate. Rachel was making sure that Sarah knew, either through text or maybe a phone conversation or whatnot, that she was dating Josh. Like, hey, look, he's spending the night with me tonight, or he's with me today. Each of them were, in essence, pushing each other's buttons. Rachel is not the one to give up. And Sarah, who now found somebody that's interested in her, doesn't want to give up either. They both want to fight for that same bad boy. Coming up, the investigators learn the details of the girls' final confrontation. Everybody in the car overhears it. I'm going to stab you and your Mexican boyfriend. It lasted no more than maybe 10 seconds tops. Eighteen-year-old Sarah Ludeman was rushed to the hospital in critical condition as detectives are piecing together what happened. Witnesses describe the stabbing as the result of a bitter feud with 19-year-old Rachel Wade. Sarah's friends explain that the girls' online battle had reached a boiling point earlier that night, around 5 p.m. I think it's a culmination of what's been happening for months. This evening, it seemed like, you know, things came to a head. Sarah was with Joshua at his sister's house. They were hanging out, playing video games. Sarah is trying to spend as much time with Josh as she can and trying to build her relationship with Josh. Suddenly, Rachel started texting Josh. Rachel was certainly trying to intervene. She was trying to pull Josh away from Sarah that night. She's trying to find out where he is and what he's up to, and will they be meeting up later, or will they be getting together anytime soon? Sarah sees what's happening, and she's becoming more upset and more angry at what she thinks is Rachel interfering with her relationship with Josh, when really, it's Josh who was still feeding Rachel that relationship. Sarah decided to end the night early and go cool off. Josh left. He was heading home. Just after 8.30 p.m., Sarah was on her way to a restaurant with Josh's sister and a friend 
when she got a call on her cell from Rachel. Rachel was continuing that pressure. She wasn't giving up. And this time, she took things to a whole new level. Everybody in the car overhears the conversation. Um, they're not paying attention to all the words, but one thing they do hear is, I'm going to stab you and your Mexican boyfriend. Sarah, at this point, is now upset and is looking now to find Rachel. She is actually wanting to now go confront her. A friend of Sarah's had just happened to be on a main road that went in through the local neighborhood, happened to drive by a house where Rachel had been standing out in front of. And she had notified Sarah that she had just seen Rachel. She knows the history between both Sarah and Rachel, and she's Sarah's best friend. They now have an idea of where Rachel is. It's not a far drive, maybe within a half a mile at the most from each other. Sarah got there within minutes. Sarah pulls up in a van. She has friends with her. And this is where the confrontation begins. Sarah stops the van pretty much just offset of the middle of the road in front of the house. And when she exits the van, she makes it to just in front of the van. Sarah's friends say Rachel left the driveway and headed straight for Sarah. And that's when the two of them got into a fight. It's more of hands flailing and hair kind of going everywhere, if you will. And it lasted no more than maybe eight seconds, ten seconds tops. None of Sarah's friends can say exactly how she got stabbed. But they all agree Rachel was the one wielding the knife. But police still need more information to be sure. And Rachel is nowhere to be found. Did she stab? Did she not stab? Maybe she wasn't the one that did the stabbing at that point. We were still trying to figure out everything that was going on and putting the pieces together. While detectives are trying to locate their suspect, they get tragic news from the hospital. Sarah has died. They obviously did what they could to try to stop the bleeding that she was suffering from. She did suffer a stab wound that actually penetrated her heart, and that was causing bleeding internally and ultimately was pronounced to cease there at the hospital. Their assault case has suddenly become a murder investigation. Thankfully, one of the witnesses tells police they saw where their suspect ran after the stabbing. That's how we... Basically, it was somebody saying, hey, that's one of the girls involved, or that's Rachel. She was sitting on this little bench at the front door. She had a straight face, almost stoic. She took out a cigarette and began smoking. The way she sat there, so calm, you know? And I don't think she really understood the seriousness of this whole thing. I approached her and, and asked her about speaking to her about what had happened that evening. Rachel agrees to come in for questioning. And what she tells investigators is shocking. You know what happened there? Coming up, Rachel tells detectives her side of the story. She was bullying me. There was a lot of harassment, and it was pretty ongoing. <laughs> Ellis Park Police investigating the stabbing of Sarah Ludeman finally have a suspect, her bitter rival, Rachel Wade. And just hours after the murder, she goes in for questioning. Hey, I want you to understand that right now you're not under arrest. Hey, you came back here voluntarily with us, and I appreciate that. Okay, but I would like to talk to you about this. In doing so, I want to read you your rights. Okay, have you had them read to you before? Yes. Yeah. She described to me how she had been dating Josh. We went back through some of that background. So it's you and Josh? Yeah, me and Josh. I've known him for and forever. Josh Camacho, right? Yeah. I've known him since like, elementary school, and we ended up dating starting in like, June or July of last year. She described these confrontational messages or conversations that she had been having with Sarah off and on. She started with me to begin with. Yeah, she started with you, me causing problems. Calling, and... I got my phone number, started calling me, started harassing me. It made, like, probably a threat every couple weeks. She'll either private call me or send me an email. She even says that Sarah threatened to kill her. She was going to beat my ass, but she was going to kill me because I was with him and she wasn't allowed to have it. 
Rachel admits to threatening Sarah, but only as an attempt to get her to back off. I did feel like she was bullying me. There was a lot of harassment, and it was pretty ongoing. As for their fight earlier that night, Rachel acknowledges that it happened. But she didn't see what happened after that. You know what happened to Sarah? How do you think Sarah ended up getting stabbed? I really don't know. We were all down there, but I don't know. She stabbed. She 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 stabbed. How do you think she got stabbed? I don't know. She's kind of beating around the bush. She doesn't mention a knife. She doesn't mention the stabbing. She just acts like, I'm the victim here. These girls pulled up. I came out. And this is what happened. I don't know what happened. But detectives aren't buying it. So they put the pressure on, telling Rachel they had multiple witnesses who saw her go after Sarah with a knife. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to tell me again the truth this time about the thing with the knife. Okay? Where did you bring it from home? I brought it from home. Okay, what kind of knife is it? It's a regular kitchen knife. She indicated to me that she had been carrying the knife or had the knife out of protection. She tells police, I was afraid for my life. I thought Sarah's friends and Sarah were going to jump me. She had called me and told me that that would be the night that she would find me. And pretty much that she was going to fight me that night. And it was not just her. She wouldn't be alone. Rachel says she had gone to a friend's house out of fear for her safety. And that's when Sarah and her friends pulled up. I was sick of the harassment, the drama, and I didn't know if it would stop it or not, but, you know, it just seemed like that's all she wanted from me. She claims that Sarah started the fight, and she was just defending herself. I don't remember a whole lot of it. I do know that my first intention was to scare them. You had a knife in your hand. How do you think that blade came in contact with her? You said she was... I was just swinging at her. I just had it, and I was swinging at her. She kept hitting me, and I just started swinging with, back with, the knife. with both hands. Okay. But police have to wonder, if Rachel was so scared of Sarah and her friends, why did she confront them? This person is in fear of someone attacking her. I guess I would have expected that person to act differently. I would have expected them to have either run into the house for safety. I would have expected them to jump into her car, which was there, and leave the scene, or perhaps pick up a phone and call 911. It was about halfway through that conversation with Rachel that I disclosed to her that Sarah had died as a result of her injuries. When I told her that, she was in complete disbelief. She broke down. I think in her own mind, Rachel thought that she had maybe just injured her. But I don't think that she ever thought that it would have ever reached the point of death. After I realized there was blood on the knife and Sarah had walked away, like I didn't know how bad the injuries were. <laughs> Rachel tells police she didn't know what to do with the knife and panicked. At that point, I was scared because I didn't know who I had harmed or how bad it was, so I threw the knife in the back area of the house. Rachel had thrown it on a neighboring roof of a house that was next door and had disposed of the knife that way. It isn't the reaction police expect from a cold-blooded killer. Could Rachel be telling the truth? Had Sarah been the one trying to take out her rival, only to have the tables turned? Investigators decide to talk to the object of both girls' desire, Josh Camacho. Having interviewed Josh, I I never got the impression from him that there was any remorse on his part. I think he encouraged the girls to go ahead and, you know, show me how important am I to you. This is the guy that they're fighting over? No one understood what was it about him. Rachel started putting stuff on MySpace. She said, because you're mine. That's what she always said. That's what they do. They put stuff on MySpace so the other one would get mad, even if it's not true. Okay, why would Sarah go to this house and look for a fight? (laughs) I told Sarah not to go. I was told by Rachel that you were encouraging her to fight Sarah if you loved her to fight with her. Is that true? That's a lie. That's a lie. Based on witness testimony and Rachel's own statement, investigators have enough to place her under arrest. At that 
point, it was very clear there was more than sufficient evidence for a second-degree murder charge. Coming up, Rachel takes the stand in her own defense. But when new evidence is revealed, will the jury believe her? We get these voice messages. You can't even believe this. I'm going to show you psycho. You're with the wrong person. On July 21st, 2010, 19-year-old Rachel Wade's trial begins. She's charged with the second-degree murder of high school student Sarah Ludeman. In the months since her arrest, the case has become a media sensation. I think part of the reason this case got a lot of attention is because you're dealing with two young girls. And a girl murdering another girl over a boy? That's just something you just don't hear about. Prosecutors argue that Rachel was a jealous ex who was willing to do anything to get rid of her rival and win back her boyfriend. So when Sarah and her friends tracked Rachel down, she seized the opportunity. Rachel had that knife and ran out into the street to confront Sarah in the middle of the road. That's a far cry from... I'm doing this out of defense, you know, as a last resort. She had to walk and cross in front of the vehicle and go towards Sarah. Rachel's actions afterward only strengthened their theory. Someone who defends themselves, they don't get rid of a, a knife. Why, right? She didn't drop it in the street. She didn't carry it with her. She took the knife and intentionally threw it onto the roof of a neighbor's house. Basically, she knows that if she gets caught with the weapon, that she's going to go to jail. Prosecutors have also obtained voicemails from Sarah's phone. Half of them would be described as antagonistic. They were confrontational. They were downright derogatory, demeaning towards uh, Sarah. Honestly, what the f*** do you have that's going for you that Josh wants you over me for? It. Not to mention that I look probably ten times better than you. I'm going to show you psycho. You f*** with me. You're f*** with the wrong person, and you're f*** with the one thing that I care about. But one voicemail in particular makes an impression on the jury. Seriously, I told you to watch the f***ing and not to f***ing kill with him. Now you're out of his mind, and I'm guaranteeing you I'm no murder you. I'm going to kill you. I swear on my life. That was a voicemail that she left for Sarah seven and a half months before she ultimately did murder her. Sarah thought that threat was significant enough to all the voicemails she gets to save it. How do you escape that fact? How do you say, well, those threats, they don't matter. How often do you have someone say, I'm going to effing murder you and they end up doing it? Rachel's attorney feels otherwise. While there is no question Rachel stabbed Sarah, they insist prosecutors haven't come close to proving intent. Sarah came to Rachel. Rachel did not go to Sarah. Then you have them whipping around and pulling up. Again, you have Rachel standing there somewhere where she's invited to be. Sarah is not invited to be there. And Sarah is jumping out, going at Rachel. So I think any person in that situation would be like, this person's coming after me. She is going to kill me or hurt me very, very seriously. The self-defense law in Florida had recently changed to stand your ground. So you have a right, if you're in a place that you're illegally allowed to be, you have a right to stand your ground and meet force with force. Rachel, you know, she should have probably not had a knife, but how do you tell her that when three girls are charging at her, all bigger than her, and she has no idea if they have something? Physically, between the two, Sarah was certainly taller. Rachel was not very big at all, and that was something that the defense obviously brought to the jury's attention in this case. As for the threatening messages on Sarah's phone, Rachel's attorneys argued they'd been nothing more than empty threats made between two angry girls. 
Is Rachel reacting back? Of course she is. Of course she's yelling back on the phone. Of course she's saying nasty things to them. To try and convince the jury, Rachel takes the stand in her own defense. My attorney actually gave me the opportunity. He told me prior that he thought that it might be a good thing, and I did agree. I thought it would be best if I said it because coming from me, you know, I just think that's the only way it was going to come out. One of the first questions I asked her was, did you lie to the detective? She said no. What do you mean you didn't lie to the detective? Did you even ever mention the night? No. Didn't he have to confront you? with the evidence so you would actually tell him the truth so she lied under oath in front of the jury there was a lot of inconsistent statements the story kept evolving over time and that's never a an indicator of innocence typically she did not do well in my opinion nobody forced her to call and say i'm gonna murder you why would you do that if you're scared of somebody it would be up to the jury to decide. On July 23rd, 2010, they returned with their verdict. And if the defense would please rise. We, the jury, find as follows, ask that a defendant in this case, the defendant is guilty of murder in the second degree as charged. So say we all. Rachel was crying, but Sarah Ludeman's parents did not believe her for a second. And I honestly feel that the jury did not either because of that voicemail where Rachel threatened to kill Sarah. Looking at the jury's face after they heard that voicemail, you knew that was the nail in the coffin. All right. Rachel is sentenced to 27 years in prison. I think I was somewhat prepared for it. Maybe not so much my sentencing, but my verdict. I'd seen the pictures of the wound. And hearing my own voice and everything, putting it together, I don't know how I would feel on the opposite end. For Sarah's family, the sentence isn't harsh enough. She could have gotten life in prison. Those who loved Sarah Ludeman absolutely will tell you that justice was not served. And it had all started because of teenage love scorn. Here's a boy that walks into their life and everything unravels. And you have two families that are destroyed forever. He had dated both of these girls, but he wasn't there at the time of the murder. He wasn't the one that caused the murder. It was Rachel's actions that caused the murder. Rachel took it to that next level that you can't go back from. Once you're there, you're done, and, and now she's paying the ultimate price. 